so about Tim, I've known Tim for about 10 years now. Um, and, you know, he really has so much knowledge about so many things, including front end development, branding and design. But of course, you know, he's here with us tonight to talk about IoT stuff. Um, he currently serves as the director of Lithios, which is a local company dedicated to creating web, iOS, and Android applications. Um, you know, and a lot of those experiences in, include integrating hardware and software devices. And with that, I'm ready to hand it over to Tim. Great to meet everyone. My name is Tim Rosberg, and let's see, I've been a designer for about 10 years. My career track um, started out with um, graphic design, branding, a transition to web, and then eventually into software design. And now I find myself doing a little bit of everything. And um, today we talked about a little bit about IoT. For today, I want to start out with talking about why IoT is difficult. And so just a little bit of background knowledge for um, for everyone in the room. Um, IoT refers to the Internet of Things. So think about um, smart lights, um, voice controlled devices, um, smart speakers, um, anything that connects a software solution with other hardware device where everything can talk to each other. One challenge is that when working with hardware, it's a totally different environment than software. One challenge is the visibility of the system status. So that just means like uh, consumers might have a difficult time with a hardware device knowing or not like what is the status of this device? Is the battery um, on? Is it off? Is it connected? Is it not connected? Something that we take for granted when having a large website or an, uh, a mobile app that can fit a lot of space, a hardware device can't necessarily show that. So users might be wondering like, well, you know, is this loading? Is it on? What's the current setting? Is this a button? Is it an indication? And what does this button do? So it's difficult to kind of fit all the information on a hardware device. So um, it's important to kind of think from a, like a, a uh, industrial design or product design point of view, making sure that it's intuitive. And so that intuitive design can also, should also be reflected in the software. Integration, you've got um, some of the big players, Apple Home, HomeKit, Alexa, and Google Home. They all have their own proprietary setup and it's difficult to kind of have one device that integrates with all of them. So people might have confusion and uh, users might think that the way that they work their Apple HomeKit automations might be different than like an Alexa routine. So understanding the nuances and difference of each platform um, is key for creating uh, a seamless experience. User friction. Um, you know, people kind of wonder, why do you, why does this app need my date of birth, social security number, blood type, favorite nickname, just to set up a smart speaker? So from a technical point of view, there is information that the device will need, but from a usability point of view, you wanna make sure that you ask the least amount as possible. Um, so for today's talk, let's make an intuitive onboarding experience for an IoT coffee maker. So um, I'm going to kind of walk through an example. Let's say that we had this IoT coffee maker that I could just uh, pull up my phone and um, say, hey, um, Google, Alexa, or Siri, or whatever device, brew coffee for me. So um, the first consideration to think about is having a paired experience with some sort of digital interface to kind of facilitate the layers of information that need to be conveyed. Um, it's difficult to fit all of this information. So in this example, let's say that this coffee maker could schedule a brew every you know day of the week at a certain time if you are home. That's some complicated configuration to do on the device. So having some sort of um, setup with a mobile app makes it a lot easier. And to understand the initial setup, I want to go over from a hardware point of view, how does a smart device become smart? So I'll be going over a little bit about how a device connects to the cloud. Um, so this is just one example. It certainly varies. Um, 
from device to device, but here's a general idea. So let's say that we have our smart coffee maker. We've got our mobile phone, we've got our router that connects to the internet, and then up above we've got the cloud that connects everything. So think of this as your um, Apple Home account, your Google Home account, or your Alexa account that just has all of your devices all connected into one place. So step one is that to get to the cloud, your phone would connect to the internet. So your phone talks to the router and then talks to the cloud. And um, so that's, you know, what you typically do. And then let's say we open the box of our smart coffee maker, we turn it on. And as soon as it turns on and you um, set up the configuration, just like your router is sending out a Wi-Fi signal, your smart device is also setting out a Wi-Fi signal to talk to you. Right now, if you look in this, you know, in this example, the coffee maker can't talk to the cloud yet. It has no idea what to do. It's kind of a dumb device so far. So the first step is that a, a smart device will send its Wi-Fi signal and then connect to your phone. So if you've ever set up a smart device like a Philips Hue light or even like a Nest thermostat or even some smart speakers, um, sometimes it'll ask you to switch your Wi-Fi network to the name of the device. So in this example, there'll be a device that has the same name as like uh, the coffee maker brand. So the phone is going to connect to the device to the device's Wi-Fi signal. So you have to disconnect from your router. And when it connects, it wants to know, hey, uh, what's your Wi-Fi password? That's what the coffee maker wants to know. So once it gets the Wi-Fi password, I can send it back. So because I have my Wi-Fi password stored on my phone, I could transfer it over. There's that communication between the two. Once my coffee maker gets the Wi-Fi password, uh, I no longer need to use my phone as a bridge. My, um, my coffee maker can connect to the router and the router connects to the cloud. And then using cellular data or even Wi-Fi, my phone can then connect to my coffee maker. So if they have multiple coffee makers, they all connect to the cloud, that central hub that stores everything together. So this is like a general idea of the hardware and technical background of how an IoT device gets configured. So as you're designing um, in Sketch or Figma, um, you know, when you're making these experiences, uh, it's important to kind of understand what's under the hood. So from, from a technical point of view, you understand all the pieces that come in. When you're designing for an onboarding experience, you understand um, what bridges need to be connected to the different parts of the experience. So um, some of these difficulties can be made seamless by using a single sign-on. A lot of devices by Alexa, Google Home, and uh, Apple Home, they do a lot of the complex Wi-Fi configur configuration for you. Um, and oftentimes one of these devices will be configured as a hub. So the hub becomes the central device that, um, such as like a HomePod or maybe a Alexa or a, an Alexa Dot device, it will, it will become your Wi-Fi hub that all the other devices connect to. And by using a single sign-on, rather than doing these complex setups each time, you just sign in and because your hub knows the Wi-Fi, it can easily connect to other devices. Another advice is to use QR codes or near field communication proximity codes so that you can connect the physical world to the virtual. Um, it's difficult to type in a serial number. No one really wants to type in like a 32 digit serial number of this uh, smart coffee maker. It's much more practical to scan a code if you have large amounts of data to connect. So when it comes to finding the URL of the app to download or maybe a URL that has instructions on the device, using QR codes can kind of bridge that gap to make it easy to use. The next tip is make sure that you're using progressive disclosure. Now this is key for any experience, but especially with IoT, rather than the example on the left where we have, you know, first name, last name, email, password, device name, what room are you in, what strength of your coffee, what's the name of the device, what room is this located? It's just too many things all at once. It's overwhelming. Um, it's much more effective to use the example on the right where we just ask you, hi, you know, one question at a time, how strong do you like your coffee? Regular, 
or bold. And then as you go along, you ask more questions. Make sure that you use real-time feedback. So as you're setting up the IoT device, it's not effective to say, wait for the light to blink. The user might be wondering, well, which light? What color is it going to blink? How quickly is it blinking? It's better to say, wait for the blue light to blink, show an illustration, and then have an animated example to show the speed at which it's supposed to be um, blinking. So that way there's a direct indication of the system status. Another tip is make sure that the hardware device uses commonly known device status indication. So if you have to connect to Bluetooth, if you're connecting, you might want to have the hardware device beep blue to say hey I'm trying to connect to Bluetooth and then once it's paired it might go to a solid blue color so uh, you know beeping is a good way to uh, a beeping of a light is a good way to indicate progress and then a solid color of a light is a good way to um, indicate a persistent state another consideration when designing for IOT is to think about asking yourself how am I leveraging the usefulness of the platform. So um, in this table, I've made um, kind of a list of the most unique and valuable um, features of each platform. So if you have a website or a desktop app, it's really great for large amounts of data and high computation. So let's say that I'm running a corporate office. I've got 200 coffee makers that I'm running in my office. It's really great to have the ability to manage the schedule for 200 coffee makers on a desktop website experience. And that's what it's really great for. Um, the phone is really great for camera, accelerometer, compass, and like GPS. So for a phone, you might say, hey, for the uh, in the phone app experience, I want to start brewing coffee as soon as I enter my home, as an example. Um, with smartwatches, Smartwatches are really great for IoT devices that maybe have a simple status. So there could be a button that says like, um, you know, just brew now. And you don't have to do a lot of heavy configuration, it's just a simple button. It says, you know, tap once, blue, brew now, or you're currently tapping. Another advantage is that wearables have biometric data. So you could say, um, if I have, if, if my smartwatch um, if my sw smartwatch sleep data indicates that I only got uh, five hours of sleep, brew an extra strong uh, cup of coffee for me. And then on the hardware device itself, the biggest advantage is that this has offline access. So if the Wi-Fi goes out, if the internet's out, if um, you know uh, Amazon server is down, um, the hardware device should be fully functional without it as a backup. So that way you just go to the button, press it, um, one thing that's off, that's very important that sometimes gets overlooked is that the hardware device needs to be fully functional even without a phone. So if, um, if you didn't have a phone, um, it's a beautiful and functional product without it. And a key advantage with voice, if you're talking to your uh, Google, Alexa, Apple um, smart devices with your voice, uh, the key advantage with voice is hands and eye-free controls. Um, so when considering designing for those experience with an IoT device, ask yourself, what voice commands can I use that are very common, that are very simple, and um, require no visual feedback or, no, uh, or very little to no um, uh, tactile or kinetic feedback. So no buttons that need to be pressed um, or no diagrams that need to be de to be displayed. So in our coffee maker example, a really a really great command would be like, hey, um, assistant, uh, brew the coffee. Um, one thing that, that would not be a good example is doing the wrong feature that doesn't match the platform. So you wouldn't want the voice command to say, hey, schedule a complex, um, brewing um, schedule for 200 of my coffee makers. That's probably better for a website experience and uh, vice versa. So those are some considerations when thinking about your platform uh, for IoT. And um, make sure that you're thinking um, in context of, uh, of, of two matrices. Think about 
how do we make experiences that are either complex or simple or designing for devices that are very stationary or very mobile. So stationary experiences such as the, the hardware device itself, whether it's a smart speaker or it's the coffee maker, it needs to be um, fully functional without any location context. So no matter um, where you are, um, it shouldn't be affected by its location. Uh, web experiences are a little bit more mobile, but uh, for a laptop is less GPS centric. Um, and then you've got your voice, your smart devices, and um, your smart uh, smart watches and your, your phones that should be more on the mobile side. So these could leverage things like GPS features, uh, geofencing, but also because um, because they are more mobile, they also become more simple. So it's recommended that you use very simple functionality. Now with a phone, you can use something that's like moderately complex, but not too complex. But with voice and with smartwatch, you want very simple, maybe one command, one one button um, functionality. So think think of your your platform in context, and it's a good idea to design a different experience per platform that leverages the advantages that each has to offer. How would usability testing for an IoT device be different than maybe one for a traditional web application? Yeah, that's a really great question. I would say that they should follow the same protocols um, as for a traditional web experience. So you're still looking at you know, visibility, you're looking at um, vision accessibility, auditory accessibility. And so one, I guess one main element that could be different is that the physical device, you have to think about the ergonomics of the physical device. Other tools or methods you would use, you know, during that design and iteration process that maybe um, people who are more into web and application design aren't aware of? Um, I would recommend uh, doing like focus groups that are contextual. So if someone's setting a, a smart device in their home, set up a set up a focus group where you're doing some sort of um, audit of how they enter in their home. Because a lot of times you might think that you've designed a really great experience, but someone's home, the way that their Wi-Fi is set up or the way that their device fits in their home might not resemble what you have in your mind. So having focus groups where you can view the view the device in context. Is, key. Well, is it typical that the coffee maker hardware is designed by the same team as the roller app US? Designs. In my opinion, the most successful ones are like different teams, but within the same company, because there's that deeper knowledge and deeper integration. It's certainly more difficult if the software provider is external from the hardware uh, provider internally. It's certainly possible, it's common from a business point of view, but it, it's less successful because there's a lot of contextual um, in-house knowledge that comes if it's um, from a different team, but within the same company. How do you prioritize end users security and UX within IoT products. Specifically, thinking of the ADT scandal that seems to have badly needed UX and customer advocacy. My recommendation is, is really focusing on delightful user experience and, and really minimize the least amount of data collection as possible. And um, I would recommend like setting up like anonymized anonymized devices that, that don't really need a personal, any personal identifiable information. So if people wanted to learn more about IoT or learn how to start designing in it, do you have any, any great resources that you could point them to? Yeah, that's a great question. I would highly recommend getting, um, starting out being a consumer. So um, get yourself like a $20 uh, Amazon dot and play around with it. A lot of my experience as a designer comes from my experience using IoT products. Um, being an outsider, if you've never used an IoT device, um, then it's if you never use it, it's difficult to design for it. And um, as you use more products as a consumer, you get to understand common patterns that different different companies have. Looks like that's everything we have in the questions. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and I hope to see you at future Triangle UXP events. All right, awesome. Thank you so much.